Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning of the 10th verse. Hear now these words. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be, that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever seen those lists of weird laws that are on the books out there? There are all sorts of ones out there. Well, a man named Robert W. Pelton, he did some research on those really weird laws and, laws, and he found ones affecting the church. And I've always wondered what was the incident that happened to make someone write this law. Because so, listen to some of these that he found. In Wheeler, Mississippi, young girls are never allowed to walk a tightrope unless it is in a church. I wonder what tightrope walking in the church made it legal as opposed to not in the church. But that's... In Blackwater, Kentucky, tickling a woman under her chin with a feather duster while she's in church services carries a penalty of $10 fine and one day in jail. <laughs> so y'all don't be tickling the ladies under the chin out there. In Honey Creek, Iowa, no one is permitted to carry a slingshot to church except the police. The NRA has not heard about this, I don't think. In Lee Creek, Arkansas, no one is allowed to attend church in any red-colored garments. I don't know how they celebrate Pentecost, but they... <laughs> and I love this one. Swinging a yo-yo in church or anywhere in public on the Sabbath is prohibited in Studley, Virginia. Someone must have hit somebody with a yo-yo. I don't know. And this one, I like. Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of a local church at any time in Slaughter, Louisiana. Because we don't want them gambling on those turtles, you know. It's... All these laws probably seemed very normal to the people at the time. But when we look back at them, they're kind of foolish, even strange. And when Paul went around preaching, I'm sure that's what people thought, that he was strange as he preached on the cross. See, the word cross was an offensive word, especially at his time. Because of the Romans. You know, they discovered some graffiti that was written on this Stavian bass in Pompeii. And one of the graffiti that someone had carved into the stone there was, may you be nailed to the cross. And in writings, the term cross was used in cursing someone. An example they found was a Roman writer, Platus, who used the phrase, go to an evil cross, when he was talking back to someone. Similarly, as you might hear the phrase, go to that other place that's down below today. And St. Augustine even noted that the Latin word for cross just sounded harsh. It was harsh to your year, ears. And yet Paul comes preaching the cross, lifting up the cross. Just a few sentences after this morning's reading, Paul talks about the problem people have with the cross. Where he writes, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Those are words that we need to hang on to. See, the Jews struggled with the cross simply because of what was written in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. See, when the law was given there with Moses, one of the laws was if a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You see, that's a stumbling block for the Jews. The Jews could not come up with the idea that Jesus was the Messiah and yet still be under God's curse because he hung on that tree. They cannot understand that Jesus actually chose to be under God's curse. How could God choose to be under his own curse? But he chose for our salvation. Jesus chose to take that punishment for our sin upon himself. Jesus chose to give up his life so that we might live. And all that seems foolish for someone to do all that. And yet Paul says that God uses the foolish things to bring power to people's lives. A short while later in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he would write this. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. See, what we believe in and what we do is foolishness to the rest of the world. Edmund Clowney had this to say about it. He said, God's wisdom is not first counsel on how to practice family values or to use common sense. It is the wisdom of his plan of grace, the wisdom of the cross. And that wisdom is foolishness to the calculations of prudence. See, when we look up what God calls us to do, it seems foolish. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up all that he asked us to do. And yet when we do it, it adds up. God is constantly using the things this world considers foolish to share his goodness and his plan for this world. And we've been filled with lots of people who've gone out there and they've tried and over and over again to prove what we believe is foolishness. And this hasn't been something new. There's one such man in the late 1800s. His name was Lou Wallace. I don't know if you've heard of Lou Wallace. He was governor of New Mexico. And he writes that, you know, I've always been an agnostic and denied Christianity. Robert C. Ingersoll, a, fam a famous agnostic, was one of my most intimate friends. And he once suggested, see here, Wallace, you're a learned man and a thinker. Why don't you gather materially and write a book to prove the falsity falsity?" concerning Jesus Christ, that no such man ever lived, much less the author of the teachings found in the New Testament. Such a book would make you famous. It would be a masterpiece and a way of putting an end to the foolishness about this so-called Christ. He says, as he was telling him that, he said, man, that just intrigued me more and more. And we started talking about it. And when I got home to Indianapolis, I told my wife, who's a Methodist, I'm going to write this book. She didn't think it was a good idea. But I began to do this research from materials in the library and in the old world. I gathered everything I could about Jesus Christ, according to legend. And after several years were spent in this work, and I had written four chapters of the book, it became clear to me that Jesus Christ was as real a person as Socrates, Plato, or Caesar. And the conviction became a certainty. I knew that Jesus had lived because of the facts connected with this period in which he lived. And then he writes, I was found myself in an uncomfortable position. I had begun to write a book to prove that Jesus Christ had never lived on earth. Now I was face to face with the fact that he was just a, his, as historic a personage as Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony, Virgil, Dante, and a host of other men who had lived in olden days. And I asked myself candidly, if he was a real person, and there was no doubt, was he not then also the Son of God and the Savior of the world? And gradually the consciousness grew that since Jesus Christ was a real person, he probably was the one he claimed to be. And he says, I fell on my knees, and I prayed for the first time in my life, and I asked God to reveal himself to me, forgive my sins, and help me to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And towards the morning light broke, 
It broke into my soul. I went into my bedroom, woke my wife, and I told her that I had received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and she was ecstatic. And so Lou Wallace did go on to write a book. It would go on to write a book to make him more famous than he was. It would become the leading Christian book of his time. It would become a number one bestseller from the time he wrote it in 1880 until Gone with the Wind replaced it in 1936 as the number one bestseller in the United States. And that book was called Ben-Hur, which is a story about another man coming to know Christ who began thinking it was foolish. See, God uses foolish things to confound the world. And yet time after time, when those who think it's foolish spend time studying and researching it, they come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. It's interesting, the cross isn't the only foolishness of God. Think about God's ways. God says to have a Sabbath, a time of refreshment and a time to come to praise God. And the world says, that's foolish. Why should you give up a day of your life? God says to take time to pray. And the world says, that's a foolish waste of time. God says to love and to be kind to your enemies. And the world says, that's just plain foolishness. You're supposed to hate your enemies. God says, trust me with your finance by giving 10% to him. And the world says, this has got to be the most foolish thing I've ever heard. Give your money away. God says, put others above yourself. The world says, no, it's all about me. That's foolishness to put others above me. And unfortunately, we as the church, we buy into the world's arguments as we listen to their argument. And we begin to think maybe it is foolish to do what we're doing, and so we don't do all the foolish things of God, and we wonder why our lives are a mess. God calls us to be about giving ourselves away for nothing. When Jesus sent out the 12 to proclaim the good news, he said, freely you have received, freely give. It's a powerful way that churches are supposed to be, to give ourselves away to the communities we're in. That's foolishness to the world, but to God, it's what he calls us to be. And churches that have taken off are the ones that have truly taken this foolishness to heart. I love this story. I came across it this week, especially since we've just finished renovating our Fellowship Hall Family Life Center. Author King Duncan tells about his former pastor, the late Steve Solly. Solly died in the spring of 2013. And at the time, he was pastor of Cokesbury Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, one of the largest and fastest growing Methodist churches in the nation. And Steve Solly says Duncan had a real heart for the people who need the gospel. And when he came first to Cokesbury, it's like I came here. He said the church was kind of there, but not meeting its full potentials. And they had plans to build a family life center. And when I got here, I found plans to build a family life center and to renovate our fellowship hall and We kind of combine the two into one. And that sounds like a good goal. That sounds like a solid Christian name, doesn't it? Family Life Center. But the first thing Steve did was to tell the trustees to change the name of that building. He said, well, it's not going to be a Family Life Center. It's going to be a Community Outreach Center. Think about that name for a moment. A seemingly minor change in terminology. Instead of Family Life Center, which is focusing on us, it's a community outreach center which is focusing on the community, using it to give away to the community. It's a way of saying to us that the focus needs to not be always our needs, even as noble as those are. But our focus needs to be on the people outside the church, and that sounds foolish to so many people. But when we focus on the needs of the people outside the church, God blesses that and honors that and glorifies that. That is the foolishness of God. When we focus on what God's want and not what we want, great things happen. This year, we need to be more foolish. We need to be a little crazy to the world. We need to have people go, huh? 
when they hear our name. Those are crazy people there. They do crazy things. They give themselves away. They love us. We don't understand it always, but they do crazy things. This year, let us be more foolish than ever. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you that you use foolishness to confound the world. So Lord, this year, help us to be a foolish church. Loving others better than ourselves, giving ourselves away, loving our enemies, giving what you have freely given us to help others. Because Lord, we want to walk in your ways and do what you've called us to do. Knowing that everything you have is ours. So there's no way we could give it all away because what you have is infinite. Help us to see that as a church, Lord. Help us to be your church in this community, loving as you love. We pray this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen.